I've come to Chesapeake, Virginia for the Battle of Great Bridge reenactment. So today we're going to see the reenactment and learn a little bit about the history of the Battle of Great Bridge. You don't realize it, but it's December the 9th. Did you know this morning at 3 o'clock from Norfolk, Captain Leslie marched in with about 300 into the back of the fort, and we didn't know it. We had heard rumors, but we didn't know. He gets here at 3.30, he puts them down to take a rest for about two hours, and he's getting ready to go on into the battle. But his orders from Lord Dunmore were this. I want you to take the two companies of Ethiopian soldiers that we have downstream five miles and we want you to have them leave in time to circumnavigate the swamp, get behind the Americans and start a ruckus at Reveille. That will draw the attention of the rebels to face that direction, reinforce that direction, and allow the British to come across the bridge and surprise them. Well, he gets here at 3.30 in the morning. It's five miles down the road. He gets to, uh, a messenger started that way. He does not know when it's time to kick off whether they have received the message or not, whether they have left to go around behind the Americans, and it's probably too late for them to start when they got the message anyway. So we don't know. He doesn't know whether they actually went off and tried to do that. We know that we did not get an attack in the rear, so that's a pretty good indicator that they didn't go, but we don't know what happened or anything else. We just know that that was his orders from Lord Dunmore to do that. So what's he do? Here's this young captain. He knows he's supposed to attack. Well, wait a minute. Why on the night? Why not just some any other day? Why not wait till next tomorrow? Why don't we wait till the next day when we have time to make sure that they, they know to go attack in the rear end? Here's why. Thomas Marshall, Major Thomas Marshall, the father of the gentleman we know of as John Marshall, Chief Justice of the United States later on. His father was Thomas Marshall, a major, who had a manservant. He instructed the manservant to cross over to the enemy side, the British side, help them get there, tell them this story. That we're less than 300 here, and we're actually almost a thousand. We're less than 300 here. We're almost out of ammunition. We're getting reinforcements from North Carolina. Colonel's bringing up eight cannons and about 600 more troops. That part was true. But the fact that we were only 300 and we're out of ammunition wasn't true. So, if Dunmore listens to this, believes it, and sends out these orders to attack now before the North Carolinians arrive, before the reinforcements get here, before the ammunition gets here. Now is when we got to do it. we got to do it. If we're going to beat those Americans, we've got to do it today. Because the North Carolinians are supposedly going to arrive on the 9th of December. As it turns out, they don't. They arrive two days later. But only four companies. The Colonel with all his other stuff is going to arrive later, like about two weeks. So give you an idea. So they have to go. So what you see happening here, they went out, they took some boards and to protect the British side, they had taken up boards off of the bridge so you couldn't get across the bridge. Well, they're laying the bridge, the boards down. Why? We don't know. We don't know any of the story. So we're over here, we're watching, and we've got guards out here. 
the hair bar in a few times, and then a couple of them will be dabble back to try and tell Lieutenant Travis that something's going on up here at the bridge. Now why aren't we excited because we hear these gunshots? Simply, <coughs> during Reveille, every morning, the two sides walk up front. So you don't know that it's anything unusual. I'm laying in my tent 400 yards behind the lines, and I hear the gunfire, but it doesn't excite me. So that's something we hear every day. And off and on all day long, we'll hear pot shots like this back and forth. But you notice that these soldiers all went back, except there's one up there, Billy Flores. Billy Flores is known as the hero of the Battle of Great Bridge. He actually stayed there and held off the British from coming down by firing about eight more shots to keep them where they were. And then he escapes back to make sure the alarm is set and has actually been heard by Lieutenant Travis. So he's working his way back, getting back to the line, trying to slow these guys up in time for the main body to be able to form. As he's doing this, he goes all the way back and he finds that he, he gets them going. Uh, they're all set. They're ready. They know somebody's coming. What's another good indicator that something's happening? When they first get in here to the island, there's, there were seven warehouses there before they burned five, went back across over to the, the area, did that about uh, the 2nd of December. We're on the 9th of December. So when they come down, there's still two buildings, warehouses there, they burn them. But well, we see buildings burning, it's kind of a good indicator that comes up. And that's what we're doing, we're watching what's going on. Now these guys are all rallied up here. Now, what you find is Lieutenant Travis has about 60 guys. You got 300 and some British coming at them. There's only six years. But they've got some two companies of Culpeper militia with them who are firing rifles versus muskets, and they're over here. So they've got a cross angle fire on the British troops as they come down, and we've got a muskets fire down here. So we've got them in a crossfire. That'll be important when you see what happens on the battlefield. The other thing that becomes important to notice is they've moved the artillery up. Because of the curve in this road, and it was that way out here originally, because of the curve in the road, they can fire through over the swamp right straight down alongside of the British and never worry about hitting the British, but they're hitting the blockade at, yeah, in the town of Great Bridge. And they're actually firing over the blockade and they're hitting the of the buildings and stuff in the town too. We're also causing a, a slight delay by the artillery drop for reinforcements to come up to the line. Because what happens is when the tra Lieutenant Travis gets notified that the British are coming, he sends a runner back to the camp. The adjutant, Captain Lee, the adjutant calls the men to arms while I'm just still getting out of my bed. In the first day, the first night in 12 days that I've had a chance to take control of the bed. I really wanted to stay there. But when they called the arms, we all fell out and they started coming up to reinforce. <laughs> because the battle is so short, it's only 30 minutes long. Because the battle is so short, what you're going to find is that the reinforcements never got up to the front. They, were, they arrived about the time everything ended. And those 60 guys held up all the bridge. Now you'll notice what happens to the British as far as getting shot, wounded, falling, getting hurt. That's a four pound brass battalion gun. The so little one over here is a swivel gun, and it's a one inch swivel gun.
Notice there's a very strict procedure to go into the go through one of our safety requirements. They must follow that procedure or I stop things or could be something wrong. There goes. Okay, now we've got the Grenadiers coming up. See those guys with those big tall hats, them the big bad team guys. Always put them out front. That Captain Fordyce is leading them. Watch Captain Fordyce. He gets wounded in the knee. Oh, right about there. And then he gets within a... We're not going to let him get close enough to the tank for safety reasons, but in actuality, he got within about six to eight yards of the barricade before he went down. He went down because he weighed too much. It was all that lead that was in him. When they found his body and they took care of it, he had 14 bullet holes in him but he had managed to get himself all the way there. He's shot the first time in the mini right here, and he marches his troops all the way up to get away. Because of his heroism and everything else, the Americans buried him out here at the church with full military honor. They thought that much of him. Now the guys with those green feathers in their hats that with the light infantry, they're mainly to protect the artillery during this turn. Or the battle, I should say. If it wasn't for that curve in the road that was actually out here, and they were shooting right in front of us, they would have had to stop fire while the British advanced. So they'd be blowing up the land too. And so you see here that they're getting things ready to go. Now, notice what he's doing. See the officer out there moving the people over this way? That's not a tactical reason, that's a safety reason. Because of the artillery crew, they've got to fire down the side of them and not over it. Okay? That's one of the things we talked about in our officer's call free for the day, how they were going to fire and move. Now, I talked earlier today about volley fire, but I'm saying you noticed that, you all stopped, you all watched, you all saw, they all fired at once. That a young man, and I don't see him, but he's probably here, who asked the question, well, I thought they fired, they fought Indian style, you know, and so why are they all in line? Well, first of all, the red coats, the big tall hats, big the world's number one fighting force, so they put them in red coats so everybody will see them. And it's a psychological thing. You've got that red wave coming at you. That's right, and they're shooting with volleys because it makes their weapon more effective. See, the brown vest that they're using in battle sometimes is not as accurate as you would like it to be because you're loading it fast and stuff. So it could have a six foot hit miss radius. I could add a, a, aim at that young man and hit that gentleman over here, or I could aim at him and that lady over there on that side. Six feet, it could miss by But if all of you fire at once, 
Does it matter if I'm aiming at him or her? Because the bullet is one like this, they're going to hit about the same height. So you're going to knock out more people by volley fire than individuals. Besides that, by volley fire, the commander can control it much better. If they're individually scattered around firing independently, uh, I have almost no control over when it starts. Yeah, I got guns, I got fights. But sometimes in the heat of battle, you can't hear all that either. Now, if I'm seeing a drum and that cannon went off just at the critical time I hit retreat, and you wouldn't hear it. So that's why it, we keep the control by keeping the culture back. Now, what he's done, he's taken that first rank, put them in, in uh, bayonets, fixed bayonets, because they're going to advance on this thing no matter what. They're going to go. They're trying to open this up. Now, the thing that's important to remember here, though, he's already been hit in the game. Uh, but he's still seen that too. Returned to the prisoners as 
because of the war later on. But, and then I did bury some of the tools of the war honors. And what happens is, once all this gets done, and make it back, you'll see Captain Leslie, by the way, who was back here waiting for these guys to break through and then they were going to rush through the, the opening of the, the uh, Royal Ethiopians and a lot of the other people. So they were still back here. They hadn't gone out. So they were safe from the carnage. But they had to bring what wounded they had there. Now they noticed on the 10th, the next day, when they crossed the bridge, it was covered in blood. So they knew there had been a lot of wounded. And when they got in the fort, it was just covered in blood. They got word from some locals that they had been, every cart, every wagon they could find was hauling wounded back to Norfolk. That they, uh, they had buried in a one single grave in the all the dead and wounded in one mass grave. So they could evacuate during the night of the 9th so the morning of the 10th when we went in there we found all this mess. So we, we know there was a lot more wounded than what was uh, done more reported. Uh, in fact, the estimates are up to about 150. Now here is uh, Captain Leslie coming out and the reason he's coming out under a white flag is he wants to parlay or talk to the Lieutenant Travis and his people who are coming out to check the wounded. Now the important part about this is his honors that he's giving is for us not doing what Dunmore said we would do. We weren't scalping, we weren't killing, we weren't trying to do all that, what we were doing, in fact, was trying to take care of the wounded and the dead out here. He is signifying honors to the American commander for treating the wounded with such courtesy and honor. And that's the way the people of Great Ridge have been throughout their lives. Always working, always treating people with fairness, goodness, and trying to help each other. Yes, I will tell you that these soldiers that were here were not mostly from here. It was from Fulkier County and Gloucester and Matthews and, and uh, York County, Dunphy. Uh, I think what else. But that's still not the end of the story. That was the 10th, the day after the party. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Scott wants us to charge the fort, chase him all the way into Norfolk, take control of all of Norfolk right away. And I say no, let's use some common sense. We know that there's been reports of 350 Royal Highlanders supposedly come in on ships that are going to be fortifying that area. We go rushing in there, we may be trapped. So we're going to wait and see what happens. We send scouts out, find out that the fortifications that they put around uh, Norfolk are next to nothing. They're just little teeny tiny worms about this high that people can lay behind, roll over, reload, and things like that. But there's nothing to stop an army. So we eventually push forward, go into Norfolk. Everybody in the military and everybody in Norfolk, and the, uh, not everybody. That those that could, loyalists, go aboard ships and they stay on the ship. Now we get all the way up until the end of December and another uh, big ship comes in, 28 guns, uh, once there's a salt ship that British claim along the shoreline. British want us to allow them to come ashore and buy rations and provisions to go back onto the ship so that they can survive out there on the ship. Of course, they say no. Why would we give them food and aid so that they can fight us and bail us out of the water with the family? 
So, and besides that, every once in a while they fire the town, the game of the town, and them. But they want us to give them food in the end. Well, I ain't gonna do that. But what happens later on is that uh, on the 2nd of January, uh, the 1st of January, uh, since we haven't provided anything, they try and get the salt ship off the side of the pier. The salt ship, uh, we prevent that. So they start firing on the city of Norfolk. I hope you've enjoyed the Battle of Great Bridge reenactment. So until next time, see ya.